Connecting Policy Research to Action. Renee? Uh, thank you very much, Bill, for um, that nice introduction. And it's really my honor to uh, be here with three of the um, outstanding and very um, uh, generous funders of Academy Projects uh, to moderate this discussion this afternoon. Um, so I, I wanted to say a couple of words um, at the beginning, and then um, uh, I'll introduce the three panelists and we can uh, start with that discussion, which we hope will include the participants after, um, after we you know, have a few uh, go rounds of questions. Um, so um, one of the uh, definitions of philanthropy is the desire to promote the welfare of others or society as a whole. And uh, you know, people uh, and organizations uh, make these um, uh, contributions to philanthropy either by donating funds, um, volunteering, or engaging in other kinds of altruistic activities. And whenever I think about philanthropy and the role of philanthropy in the United States, I'm always reminded of um, Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in the United States discussion of the role of um, private uh, and collective associations in American life. Uh, so very early on, uh, collective associations uh, have been um, uh, key uh, participants in helping to advance social welfare in the United States. Um, he saw these organizations to be in competition with government, um, but um, government in some ways is our, um, you know, uh, most broad-based form of collective action in some ways. And today we have um, all kinds of different levels of um, ways in which, or uh, forms of contributions to philanthropy. There, uh, there's uh, philanthropy by individuals, I already mentioned government, uh, corporations, community organizations, and then today's uh, discussion will involve foundations. And I hope that um, as part of this discussion, um, each of our panelists might address, you know, how they see the role of foundations relative to some of these other players in the phil uh, philanthropic space. Uh, but um, to focus the conversation today, um, you know, philanthropies like the foundations that um, are represented by our panelists today really do play important roles in advancing um, uh, strategies to improve economic security. Uh, all kinds of activities, uh, they fund all kinds of activities, uh, policy advocacy uh, and helping build the evidence base and public will for some of these strategies. Um, and, uh, you know, some as in the case uh, with our participants today have funded pilot projects that perhaps uh, provide uh, an incentive or uh, impetus for state and federal governments to try new approaches. And um, other and in other ways, um, uh, you know, this through direct financial support of projects. And we'll talk all about that today. Um, and um, I think that one of the, the uh, inspirations for this panel is to think about ways that we can strengthen the connections between philanthropies and the groups they support and how um, the funders and the uh, organizations that are supported by the funders can work uh, more effectively together. Um, so we have three representatives of uh, three of the Academy's funders for economic security work. Um, I want to, uh, I hope that all of them, each of them will address, address how they view their work uh, and um, how they view their investments uh, in uh, reinforcing economic security and how they view their investments in the stakeholder organizations receiving funding. And I uh, hope that we'll have a conversation eventually about how to, um, uh, how to work uh, more effectively together. So uh, without further ado, our three panelists today are Anna Waja, who is the um, uh, Senior Program Officer for the Future of Workers Program at the Ford Foundation. And uh, the Ford Foundation has, uh, uh, been a multi-year uh, funder, a multi-year supporter of the Academy's U universal family care work, uh, which, uh, you know, was started several years ago, but now seems more prescient uh, given um, the family care um, uh, deficits that have been laid uh, more completely bare uh, by the, uh, pan the COVID pandemic crisis. Uh, so I, um, uh, and so, th so that's Anna. Um, Anna. 
And then Joel Eskovich, who is the Senior Policy Advisor at the AARP Public Policy Institute. And the AARP presents, um, uh, provides support for the Academy's work aimed at improving retirement security for older workers. Um, and especially uh, a year or so ago, uh, we had uh, a, co a collaborative project with AARP um, on uh, presenting a social security innovation challenge uh, aimed at um, uh, the challenges particularly experienced by um, uh, older workers who do not need, meet the definition of disabled, uh, but who may have prolonged spells of joblessness. And then finally, our third panelist is a Naomi Stanhouse, who is a program consultant for the RRF Foundation for Aging, formerly the Retirement Research Foundation. And she uh, will talk about some of the work of that foundation on uh, economic security, uh, aimed at uh, promoting economic security in later life and how the work of other of the Academy and other policy groups um, might affect uh, the activities of that foundation. So um, starting, with, um, uh, the, starting with Anna, um, Anna, um, would you um, like to talk about um, how your, the Ford Foundation plans to sustain its investment in family caregiving. Um, and, um, you know, what are, what are some of the next steps you foresee in this effort? And uh, what are the goals? Um, and how do you see, um, you know, working together with your partner organizations and trying to work toward those goals? Sure, thank you so much, Renee. It's really a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and, you know, I wanted to just start by thanking NAZI for the way in which this conference has been organized. So many times policy wonks get together and they talk about social programs in the abstract. And, but the voices of those who interact with these systems on a daily basis are largely absent or ignored. So you guys flipped the switch on that for this conference. And I personally really appreciate that. I found I have found all of the sessions not only insightful, but also moving. And I know that's been a huge amount of work. So I just wanted to congratulate the NASI staff and board for, um, for how this has all been brought together. As Renee said, my name is Anna Wadia. I'm a senior program officer in the Future of Workers program at the Ford Foundation, where we aim to ensure that all workers, no matter their status, have equal rights to labor protections, that social protections are guaranteed to all, and that workers shape the policies and economic systems that affect their lives. And we bring a deep commitment to undoing exclusions and promoting justice across race, gender, ability, and other forms of oppression. I, you know, like to spend a few minutes this afternoon reflecting on this panel's theme of making connections and how it has shown up and continued to show up in our work um, much in uh, in many ways in relation to some of the points that Renee raised. You know, one of my favorite roles as a program officer is being a matchmaker. And I especially like bringing together sort of researchers and organizers. Um, and I think it's about Five years ago, in 2016, Ai-jen Pu and Sarita Gupta, who are the co-founders of Caring Across Generations, were cooking up this new bold idea they, that they were calling universal family care. And they were trying to figure out whether there could be a universal social insurance program that covers families' caregiving needs across the life cycle, including paid leave, child care, and long-term services and supports, and whether that could be done in such a way to that would also improve the quality of care jobs. So as soon as I heard social insurance, I thought, well, you guys need to meet NAZI. <laughs> so I introduced iGen to Ben Bechti, who was the policy director of NAZI at the time. And that was really the seed of a partnership that a few years later resulted in this incredible study commission report on universal family care. And I actually think the last time I spoke at NAZI in person, of course, was at the release of that commission's report in June of 2019. 
Um, and you'll get to hear a little bit. If you, if you want to hear where that's gone, there is a, a workshop session right after this one on universal family care in the States. Um, because NASI and Caring Across and their partners at the state level have continued to bring advocates and researchers and organizers together to do this kind of bold experimentation that Dorian talked about earlier with state programs to deliver this whole range, to, to deliver and importantly to finance this whole range of care needs. What is um, equally significant is that this vision of a set of policies that addresses all of our care needs while creating good jobs for the mostly women of color who work in care sectors, that vision has just burst onto the national scene. The I often say that the pandemic has ripped the invisibility cloak off of something that everyone in this virtual room has known forever. And that is, that care is vital to the very functioning of our economy and that we cannot have an equitable, sustainable economic recovery without massive public investment in a robust care infrastructure. And so also relating to the theme of this panel and really building off all of the great uh, sessions so far, um, the pandemic has brought to the forefront all of the connections across policies and constituencies that unfortunately have historically been siloed. Um, you know, as, as we heard from the very beginning of the conference, the pandemic and the economic crisis and the heightened focus on structural racism have put in stark relief the interconnections between care, work, racial, gender, and disability equity and the economy. In just as one example, home health aides, personal attendants, and early educators are now being called essential workers, but the legacies of racism and slavery and xenophobia and sexism remain, and they, they continue to be among the most poorly compensated and least protected workers in our economy. Um, and many of you in this room have been showing for years the connections between improving the quality of jobs and improving the quality of care. And I mean, nowhere is this more starkly and tragically illustrated than in the mass deaths in nursing homes over the past year. And then, you know, again, as Dorian pointed out, all of the jobs lost in December were held by women, mostly Latina and black women. And, you know, this really is due to a kind of double whammy. I, I loved in the, in, the, uh, in the paper that was released for this conference, uh, you talk about the labor market and the social protection side. It's not one or the other, it's really both. And this is a double whammy for women because on the labor market side, the sectors where women predominate, including care sectors, have been among the hardest hit. And at the same time, whatever meager care supports, whatever meager social protections families have had, um, whether they're caring for children or older or disabled family members, those have just been shattered. Um, so they're hit on both sides. And this has led to a loss of income, asset depletion, gaps in paying into social security, all of this, and, and I'm sure this is something that my fellow panelists, especially Naomi will probably talk about, um, you know, it puts in stark relief um, the fact that the lack of caregiving support across the life cycle is a key driver of women's economic insecurity as they age. And then, um, and then something else that really came out in the workshops um, is that, uh, you know, it's absolutely essential for older people and people with disabilities that we have a well-financed long-term services and supports infrastructure that favors home and community-based services. But we also need to remember that older people and people with disabilities are also workers, right? And they need paid leave. Grandparenting family need childcare. So it is all of the above. It's not just one or the other. So given all of these connections, we're actually really thrilled to see what has developed and grown in the field since the days of the Universal Family Care Commission. Um, 
there's so much more alignment in the field across these movements. One great example is a table called Make Care Count, which I know several of the groups here uh, it, that have been featured in this conference are part of, like Community Change, Caring Across Generations, National Women's Law Center, and the ARC. Um, and Make Care Count is building this coalition to bring together a racially and economically diverse movement of caregivers, care workers, and care recipients to advocate for an equitable, comprehensive, and publicly funded care infrastructure. Um, and they recently put out a paper on this, which I I can put in the chat if it hasn't already been put in there. I'll do that after I speak. Um, and you know what's really interesting is they engaged economists from the very beginning. So this is also a um, example of bringing sort of academics and researchers together with advocates. So they engaged economists from the very beginning, and this is has a profound effect. The Biden administration includes a broad caregiving agenda, not as part of its social services um, plan, but is a core pillar in its economic plan. And this would not have been the case even a few years ago. So I think that's extremely significant. So I just want to close by saying that what we're trying to do now at Ford is mirror this type of alignment within philanthropy. So we want to bring funders together across all of these issues and constituencies and try to break down some of these silos in philanthropy. So once we, once my fellow panelists have had a chance to speak and we turn to the discussion. I would actually love to hear from all of you. Like if you could take a hammer and break down <laughs> some of the silos in philanthropy, what would be some of the silos you would most like to see um, go away? So with that, um, I'll turn it back to Renee and look forward to your question. Great, Anna, thank you so much. Um, I think the, the siloed aspect of things is really important. I actually, this is kind of a silly analogy, but I think about, you know, what newspapers choose to put, what articles they choose to put in which sections of the newspapers. And the profiles of le women who are business leaders always end up on the living pages and not the business pages or the news pages. And I think back in 1986, 85 or 86, I had a letter to the editor published in the Boston Globe complaining about that, and it's still happening. And so I think that, you know, this failure to see this all as being totally interconnected is a, is a really important point that your remarks highlight. So thanks very much. So next, um, let's move to Joel, if that's okay. And, um, you know, as I mentioned uh, in introducing Joel, uh, one of the uh, projects that um, AARP has funded recently with um, the National Academy of Social Insurance was the um, Social Security Policy Innovation Challenge. And um, it is moving forward to, uh, you know, sort of build on that work with the Older Workers Retirement Security Task Force that's currently underway. So I guess two questions I have for you, Joel, that maybe you could address um, as you uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, talk about this work. One is, uh, what about the role of things like that innovation challenge, you know, challenges as, um, you know, ways to uh, develop the, you know, uh, policy or evidence base for social programs? How does that compare as a process with other kinds of, you know, philanthropic funding? And then, um, and then second, um, you know, what do you think about um, long-term commitments with particular, you know, grantees or funding particular projects? Um, is it, you know, there has been this, um, you know, you know, some sense that some funders are more episodic in their funding of projects, you know, funding this isolated project here, isolated project there. So what about, you know, taking a more long-term view of that kind of relationship? Sure, uh, th and thanks, Renee. Uh, um, I, I work at the uh, ARP Public Policy Institute, and so we we do uh, our own research, and we also partner with other organizations. So on the long-term funding piece, I mean, ours ours is more piecemeal. I think there are other aspects of ARP and our foundation and such that do you know some longer-term projects, but but certainly we like to partner with organizations that can add value and insight into the work that we're doing. Um, and I'm happy to, to walk through kind of this particular issue, which is one that we've really been circling around uh, for quite a bit and worked with uh, NASI uh, on for several years now. 
and it's central to our, our mission at ARP of, of improving the financial security of older Americans. But this is a certain subset of that uh, older worker group. And, and, and these are folks um, who are struggling to make it to even the early Social Security um, retirement claiming age of 62. Um, these are people that are not quite eligible for Social Security disability insurance, but their job is so taxing that expecting them to work longer and deeper into their 60s and 70s is not realistic. So this group already faces financial challenges. And now that the full retirement age continues to move up two months every year, uh, they face essentially what is a benefit cut if they can't make it past 62. So this group, however, has historically been ignored in conversations about longevity and working longer. We know not everyone's living longer and we know not everyone has the type of job where they can sit in front of a screen and be unconcerned about the physical challenges associated with their work. I think as Anna pointed out, you know, uh, there was kind of an invisibility cloak around this group of workers that we now know as essential workers. But at the time, I think there was a prevailing sentiment that you know, these are manufacturing, construction jobs, they're not a big segment of the economy you know, not every, you know, most people can work and, and live longer. And, and, you know, that is just not the case. And, and we've certainly seen that uh, during the pandemic. Uh, that, you know, there is a huge overlap between essential workers and the target population of, of our innovation challenge. Um, we now have a better understanding, you know, not just frontline workers, but people like cooks and hairdressers, preschool teachers, home health aides. Uh, there's it's a whole range of jobs that you really don't want to be doing, you know, in your 70s. So we first partnered with NASI in 2018 um, to try to find a way to improve the long-term outcomes for these workers. Uh, one of the reasons we turned to the Academy was we wanted to be really clear about our intention. We were not, you know, to provide a safety net to all those uh, working what are essentially some of the riskiest jobs out there um, and that we didn't want to undermine any existing supports. So we saw this partnership as a way to highlight our commitment uh, to the existing social insurance program. Uh, we did this innovations challenge. I, I think it was a really unique way to, to bring new voices in. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of folks in the social security space that, that you see a lot and, um, and we wanted to get some new ideas. And so uh, on the front end, the Academy was able to use its, its network um, of members and uh, to promote the challenge. And uh, the Academy did a lot of work on the front end to make sure that people understood exactly who we're talking about here uh, it's a very uh, nuanced discussion, and they helped uh, judge and select winners. Um, and, and we found four uh, really great ideas um, from a benefit that would create a bridge from early retirement age to the normal retirement age, to ways to claim partial benefits, start and stop benefits, um, and to other approaches that lean on states and increase access to employer-based retirement plans to help fill in some of the gaps. But uh, the real value out of the Academy in this process was, you know, and, and we convened these winners and other experts to pressure test the ideas and refine them before uh, publicly releasing them. Um, but we recognized that the work was not quite done uh, with that innovation challenge. One of the things, one of the drawbacks, I think, and, and a lot of it was on our end, was, was we were very focused on protecting DI and we may have inadvertently pushed people to kind of avoid talking about DI. As we noticed in our applications, we did not get much that really built off of that uh, system and leverage some of the, the things that do work with the disability program. Um, and so we also recognized we still had a gap in, in identifying who these workers are and uh, how they work and move in and out of the economy. So we had a few holes uh, that we still wanted to fill and this is where we moved from kind of the innovation challenge to really getting the expertise of, of the folks in the social security, but also disability, uh, you know, uh, working uh, labor market uh, uh, folks. And we really wanted to get uh, those gaps filled. Uh, and so continuing to work with the academy made a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, they, that's the, the uh, um, that Liam Neeson movie that uh, Taken which I actually haven't seen, but I, I know the quote, you know, we were looking for people with a very specific or particular set of skills. And so that's what the Academy, I think really uh, brought to the table. We, we have a lot of policy experts at ARP, but the depth and breadth of the expertise amongst the membership allowed us to glean into insights from uh, people who have intersected with social security, disability and retirement system from just about every conceivable angle. Uh, and so this older workers retirement security task force 
as members ranging from those who help design and run aspects of these programs to those who've advocated for applicants to those who have or, or are currently receiving benefits. Uh, and they know the ins and outs of the system, where it's lacking, and whether it would be better to create an option that works inside the disability system or one that is created from whole cloth. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, that's, that's kind of the core of what we're working on in the task force. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have great partners, great members. A number of the task force members are, looks like, in, on the list here. Um, and so I'm really optimistic we're going to have some, some uh, good solutions going forward. We've convened our first meeting uh, uh, of the task force. Barbara Boberg, who just retired from the GAO, is, is running the task force. Um, but ultimately, our goal here is not you know, an academic exercise. We really are looking for a solution, one that, that we could all get behind, both at ARP and the Academy and, and groups that uh, our members are coming from. Um, you know, we, we know Social Security reform may be here sooner than we uh, you know, realized. And so we want to have an option that uh, we can push for to, to ensure that these workers, uh, you know, the essential workers, but also others that are just performing these physically demanding jobs, that, that they're protected regardless of what happens uh, to the program. And we think, you know, this partnership is, is a really good way to, to move the ball forward. So I'll conclude. Oh, I think you're on uh, mute, mute still, Renee. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I always have to be reminded that, that at least once every panel. Uh, okay. um, um, thank you very much. And I'm really glad you emphasized the role of our members in, in the contributions they make to the Academy's work. Um, like a lot of organizations, you know, it's really all about the people and who the people are and their level of expertise and their commitment to finding, you know, actual practical solutions to some of these issues that you highlighted. So I want to um, say thank you for giving that shout out to our members because that's really the strength of the organization and what makes it worthwhile to be involved. Um, so um, Naomi, um, uh, thank you for um, waiting patiently. Um, but um, what what I, I'll ask, throw out a couple of questions and then I'm uh, curious, um, you know, how you might, you know, react to some of the things also that um, have been said so far. Um, so what should grant recipients or applicants do to make most effective use of the funding that they receive from funders like RRF? Um, what does RRF hope to achieve as a return on, on its investment in working with organizations in terms of research, advocacy, possibly organizing? Uh, and then I'm going to ask, you know, I hope that the, some of the stakeholder um, participants in this session will um, think about responding to the flip side of that question when we get to that point in the, in the conversation. Okay, thank you, Renee. And again, thank you to the Academy for the opportunity to introduce or reintroduce RRF Foundation for Aging. I will get to your questions, but I think, uh, you know, in breaking down the silos that Anna was talking about earlier, one of the first ways to break down is to get to know each other better. And while I bet most of the people who are listening and hopefully participate know Ford and know AARP, there may be many who don't know RF Foundation for Aging. So indulge me to give just a little bit of background on that. Uh, many of you may know us by our former name, the Retirement Research Foundation. Um, but recently, um, following our strategic planning in 2019, we both changed our name and changed our way of working. So we changed our name because in some ways, um, our uh, Retirement Research Foundation was a misnomer. While we do fund research, policy research, clinical and um, uh, social behavioral research, we also fund professional education and training, direct services and advocacy. We give away about $7 million a year across the nation um, for projects that align with our mission to improve the quality of life of older people. And for RRF, older people means people 65 and over. Um, so in supporting policy research, which many of us in the audience um, do, we look for ways that research can advance policy through collaboration with policymakers and with advocates who can use the research as a strategic tool. Um, not only are we one of few funders that focus exclusively on older people, but we're even one of even fewer funders that will fund advocacy. So that's an important space for us. Um, in our new way of working before, over our 40 some years of grant making, we primarily responded to proposals that came in over the transom. But 
through our strategic planning, we now focus on four priority areas. One is economic security and later life, in which I'm the champion at the foundation for that. Uh, the other areas are family caregiving, um, uh, supportive and affordable housing, and social and intergenerational connectedness. We're now trying to be much more intentional and proactive in the way we work, reaching out and inviting promising ideas that will lead to partnerships and grant making opportunities. And the key is partnerships. Again, Anna, you talked about partnerships and being matchmakers. Um, in working with grantees and applicants, one of the most important things to make things stronger is to identify, identify the partnerships that are important to get um, an idea across a finish line. So last month we produced our first issue brief entitled Working Together to Achieve Economic Security in Later Life. I hope you all read it, it's on our website right on the homepage under news and information. And it describes the three aspects within the economic security area that we work in and that we're looking for promising ideas in. The first area is providing access to sufficient income. For, for low, low income older people, which is our primary focus, having sufficient income means reliance on a combination of social security and the safety net of public benefits. And it requires navigating complex programs. So much of our funding in, that, in this area goes to organizations directly assisting older people to access resources. The second area centers on building financial knowledge and skills and recognizes that older people face challenges in managing income and savings in understanding social insurance programs and benefits, ensuring their housing doesn't become a liability and in, in addressing debt. In this area, we're looking for ways to educate consumers and protect against financial exploitation, frauds and scams. Our third area involves advocating for a stable, equitable retirement system. Here's where we're trying to move the needle to improve and shore up social security and Medicare, the private pension system and personal savings vehicles. We recognize, as this conference does, that economic security in later life doesn't start in later life. It's a pathway. And that's where the challenge is for a funder like RF being in the space of older people. How can we find the intersections with groups that focus on younger adults? How can we encourage collaboration with groups where there's common ground? I just want to give one example of collaborative work, which shows the approach that RF takes to grant making. We try to connect researchers, advocates, policymakers, and the business community with the goal of helping people become better prepared financially for later life. So RF supported the development of the first statewide employer-based retirement savings program for low to moderate income workers in Illinois who had no other access to a retirement savings program. So beginning in 2013, we began investing in the de development of what became the Illinois Secure Choice Program. That became law in 2015. The program automatically enrolls workers into a tax exempt IRA. It applies to all Illinois businesses that have been in operation for more than two years and have more than 25 employees um, and, and businesses that do not currently offer a retirement savings program. The goal of our funding was to enable key organizations to work together to educate policy, policymakers, workers, the general public and the media about the retirement insecurity facing over half of Illinois' private sector workers and to build support for creation of secure choice. The goal was also to build a model program with a set of tools and an advocacy approach that other states could use. Over a five-year period, period, we made a series of grants simultaneously to three organizations, Woodstock Institute, Small Business Majority, and the Shriver Center on Poverty Law. The funding allowed for research to determine the number of employees by legislative district who did not have access to an employer-based retirement savings program and the economic impact on the workers, their families, and the legislators' communities. The research was converted to short pieces that advocates could use with their legislators. The media used the research and played a key role in advancing secure choice. Small businesses were educated and their support was garnered for the program. The funding provided for technical assistance to the state on ERISA issues and staff support for the Illinois Asset Building Group, which was the principal advocacy arm of the Secure Choice campaign. So in this way, it just shows that we went from research to policy creation to policy implementation, 
to, mo to monitoring policy, and then now towards expansion, because the next phase of Secure Choice is coming, and RF hopes to have a role in seeing the program expand to even smaller businesses and gain greater uptake by employees. I hope I've given you a picture of RF's particular focus on economic security for older adults and our collaborative approach. So we invite you to partner with us and to find solutions to advance economic security of older people. Thank you. Oh, great, Naomi, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I was struck by that uh, an overlap on all three of your presentations um, was the focus on the role of the states, you know, that there were some of the proposals that came out of the uh, challenge, the AARP challenge were state-based ideas. Um, and then Anna, the uh, uh, family care ideas are, you know, have been, you know, until recently really targeted at the states. And you mentioned this sort of state approach. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the saying goes, you know, the states in the United States are the laboratories of innovation and experimentation, uh, the famous Brandeis quote, but the, um, uh, but also, um, you know, there's kind of an issue and a concern there because, you know, what if people move throughout their lifespan? Um, what if, um, you know, what about, um, you know, the competitive, you know, uh, disadvantages perhaps that a state might encounter because of, you know, uh, you know, trying to strike out for some of these innovative programs. I don't know if how you all think about the, you know, the sort of balance and the trade-off between state-based programs and federal-based programs. And, you know, um, maybe we could start with Naomi and then go, sure. you know, back in reverse sure. order. Well, not only are states the laboratory, but let's face it, over the last number of years, we haven't been able to advance much policy at the federal level. So we had to use the states, one, to pilot, but two, to build momentum to federal policy change. So we look at both the laboratory, the pilot, the ability to pilot, and the momentum building as, as strategies for investing in state-based programs. Just regard to like, oh, people move, et cetera. Yes, developing state-based policies involves making sure there's portability, which in secure joys and programs like that, there is. But there's no doubt that, you know, we had MIRA, my IRA at the federal level which couldn't go anywhere. So the importance of building the state-based programs to get to the federal level, I think is an important strategy. Great. Um, Joel, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a, a good point is, is you know, you, you have to go where, where you can actually make some progress. And, and on the social security front, I mean, obviously it's a federal program, but one of our solutions did touch on, on having some sort of a, a, a state option to, to augment uh, uh, benefits and 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 I think certainly in our retirement uh, security uh, area we've we've been pushing on the state level but but I mean there there is no uh, uh, all, you know better alternative than a federal response if, if we want to capture everybody so ideally that that it would be the end result but sometimes the way you get there is is by way of the states right and the unemployment system was you know sort of as kind of right. a, a model for that and as well as um, you know universal health care um, uh, requirements as well. Um, Anna. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with, uh, with what my colleagues have said. Um, you know, states are actually a great place to test out different models and refine models um, as you scale to national. But then what you need is also to have the to, to, ha to have the state winds build momentum for federal change. Um, and to be as strategic about that as it sounds like um, RF was strategic about the uh, policy change in Illinois. Um, but then it also works the other way around because in many of the programs that, um, that I was referring to, um, even when you have a win at the federal level, the win at the federal level is often for money that gets channeled and implemented through the state. So you have got to have a really strong um, infrastructure of advocates and service providers who are working together at the state level to make sure that the policies are implemented well. Because if they're not implemented well, then they don't have any impact on the people you're aiming to have an impact on. Um, and that there needs to be this constant feedback loop um, so that what's learned at the state level then informs um, improving the policies at the federal level. Um, so, um, and also you need that 
constituency at the state and local level to preserve policies. Because the other thing that we've seen, especially in the last couple of years, is that wins are not permanent and can be rolled back. And so you really need to build a base to win the policy, but you also need that base to be to be continue to be invested in that program to prevent rollback. Yeah, can I add something on that? Um, one of the other things that's really important, we as a funder really see community engagement as almost a goal in, in itself. And I was really struck by, uh, I think it's Darian Walker from Community Change who spoke a little while ago about you know, the importance of community organizing in that, you know, it's an all hands on deck moment was his line. And I think that's really important. And it's hard to um, engage consumers at the, you know, on the national level of policy, you know, that line, all politics is local, you know, can you get it's much easier, and even that's not easy to get consumers engaged at the local or at even the state level. So um, I think that's just an important piece that community organizing and that peer advocacy is really important. Um, one of the other questions that um, you know this discussion brings up um, is, uh, you know, and uh, I'm reminded of Anna's comment about silos. Um, how do we um, how do we bridge those silos among even the funder organizations, right? So you know, someone you know makes a proposal to RRF. And you know, you're, it's not quite the right fit for the priorities that you have. How do we connect you know, those uh, potential applicants to the, perhaps the right source of potential funding? Are there mechanisms that the foundations can use to try to do that? And maybe you're doing more of that now than, I, than I'm aware of. So I'm, I'm willing to admit ignorance. Want me to take it? Okay. Talk to us. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing is like, you know, we, we need to get to know you. You need to get to know us. Um, you know, we pick up the phone. We answer our emails. But we also have a more formal process called a letter of inquiry or a letter of intent, you know, in which we give substantive feedback. So we don't ask for a full proposal. We ask for a few pages in which you tell us your idea. And, you know, so to avoid going through the hoops of a long proposal, we'll give you substantive feedback. It's okay. And we'll say, how can we align better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are there, um, but there are there mechanisms or, you know, I, you know, there's a grant making association in Massachusetts that I know about. Um, are there similar kinds of organizations, you know, for, you know, foundations of different sizes uh, in different spaces that communicate about, you know, the different projects that, you know, some of them see that might be, you know, better suited to another organization's funding uh, priorities? I mean, there are regional grant makers, associations everywhere, there are affinity groups, but, um, you know, I think you're hitting on something important. I don't think there are a lot of formal mechanisms to do that. Um, I find myself doing that a lot informally um, where somebody might reach out to me and I'll say, you know, this, doesn't, uh, this isn't something the Ford Foundation can fund for one reason or the other, but, um, you know, you, know I, you might want to look into this or that other foundation. Um, and then the other thing that, that we're doing that I referenced is we're starting to work with um, foundations across the care continuum to actually pull resources. And we're just in the early stages of doing that and so haven't exactly figured out all of the mechanisms by which we will, um, we will do the grant making. But, um, you know, pooled funds like that do sometimes do open request for proposals, which is a way to, um, it's sort of almost like the kind of challenge that Joel talked about, you know, the way to, to crowdsource new ideas. I, I don't know whether we'll do something like that or not, but that does sometimes happen. Mm -hmm. Joel, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a slightly different, uh, you know, position here because we're, we're not typically, uh, except for that innovations challenge where we were, you know, actively soliciting uh, requests. Typically, we are more the instigator of, of the uh, the funding, uh, you know, stream than than the uh, recipient. But uh, um, uh, yeah. So, what advice do you have for people who are your grantees about how to, you know, manage the relationship with you effectively to make sure that the 
the goals stay aligned and, uh, you know, that the relationship is a productive one and that, you know, the, you as the funder, you know, achieve what you want to achieve through the project and that the stakeholder feels, um, you know, like the, like the investment has been, um, has advanced their work and has not just been, you know, another sort of, you know, thing to manage in the day. Um, I don't know which one of you might want to take that one first. That's one of the questions. I mean, funding, funding is relationship building, you know, and so I think it's incumbent on both the funder and the grantee, and so to speak, um, to keep the communication going. So, you know, while we do check-ins, we ask grantees to share the products, share the developments, share, share the challenges, the things that aren't going right, so we can get in and try to pitch together to make them better. But we also now, you know, in our more proactive way of communicating what's going on and what we do is to try to share the successes and the lessons with, you know, through our social media, through our grant makers and aging association, through our work with other funders um, to, I, I would say, to expand the return on investment. Great. Um, we do have a couple of um, questions that um, have been submitted and then, um, uh, uh, so maybe I'll, we could start with uh, taking those from our audience. Um, so um, one question from an anonymous attendee is what is the best way to start new relationship with funders like your organizations? Um, how might organizations and individuals get a foot in the door, so to speak? You know, getting the first grant probably, you know, like everything in life is the hardest thing, right? Getting the first job, you know, your first degree, all of that sort of stuff is the hardest thing. Yeah. Well, I already said there, there are many ways to approach us, but right, I think right. it's sad to say get the foot in the door because that implies the door is closed. And in our case, I hope we think the door is open. So. Right. Anna, what about you? Yeah, I mean, it is, I think, I think it's really important to do your homework um, and know different kinds of funders. I mean, Ford is a large national funder. We generally support... Um, either national efforts or multi, like if we're supporting state or local efforts, it's often through a national network or, um, or state and local efforts that are models for national change in some way. Um, so, um, so part of it is, is sort of understanding the focus of the foundation, both in terms of the issue focus as well as the um, sort of level of grant making. Um, I often think like, you know, I, I think it is all really, it is very relationship based for better or worse, right? Um, but uh, events and conferences and things in, um, when, when we get back to being able to be in person, I think are very important. Um, I think um, if you are, let's say, a local organization that has some local funders that have really been investing in you and you see them as partners, like talk to them about how they can showcase your work. So let's say a local funder of yours, let's say you're being funded by a community foundation that's active in grant makers in health or grant makers in aging. Um, you know, taught, perhaps that funder can showcase you on a panel and that would then give you exposure to other larger foundations that, that might come to that. So, so I think it's always really helpful to find those one or two funding, funders who are your long-term supporters and have been your partners and, um, and brainstorm with them about how, um, how they can help introduce you to the broader philanthropic community. That's a useful, that's a useful idea, definitely. Um, Joel, anything to add? Yeah, yeah. And, and I would just say, I mean, uh, to, to piggyback off of what they said, I, I think also, you know, doing your homework to, to understand, you know, strategic alignment. Are, are you, uh, is what you're doing in, in the same um, vein as what the, the organization is, is aiming to do? And, you know, with our innovations challenge, for instance, we were looking for bipartisan, you know, mainstream, uh, solution. So if, if you were, you know, very progressive or very conservative and, and you had an idea that would, you know, cut benefits or, or raise taxes only and just do one thing, you know, that probably wasn't going to be uh, on, you know, within our, our universe of, of, of funding options. So, 
you know, a lot of it is right networking and, and, and just doing some homework on, on whether your viewpoint lines up with, with where the funders want to be. Uh, so we have another question um, from the Q&A, um, and I'm not positive I'm going to pronounce this uh, member, the name of the member of Congress correctly, so I apologize if I, if I mispronounce it. Um, the question is about a proposal um, for Representative Suozzi um, with an effort to provide federal catastrophic long-term care insurance a cash benefit after a waiting period that is longer for persons with more lifetime income. Uh, and uh, the questioner says that this kind of strategy, seem, strategy seems to be especially useful um, and with a very, you know, 0.5% insurance contribution from wages over a lifetime. Beneficiaries would get $120 a day cash for flexible use. Um, or do you want, do you feel comfortable commenting on these specific kinds of things? You know, the long-term care issue has been one that, you know, the Affordable Care Act did try to address and then that, that it turned out that that program wasn't workable. So we're kind of back to the drawing board on that for long-term care insurance. So I, I don't know if you want to, maybe Anna, have you thought about that kind of issue or are you aware of this proposal? You know, I, I just recently heard of it. I have to admit, I have not had a chance to study it and um, also do need to be careful. I can't comment on particular pieces of legislation, but um, but I would defer, I don't know if other, there, there may very well be others in the, um, among the participants who might want to add in the chat um, their, their views on this. Um, I'm, I apologize that I can't right now. No, no, that's quite all right. And, uh, you know, it sort of comes, uh, you know, kind of as a surprise. And I don't know, Joel, if it has come to, you know, what, what, what AARP is thinking about long-term care insurance these days. Um, yeah, that's uh, unfortunately not an area that, that I uh, do a, a ton of work in. So I, I'm, I'm not really in a good spot to comment on it. All right. Okay. Um. Oh, so um, uh, one of there's another comment that says that uh, you know this, the person identifies themselves as a committee staffer and this a former committee staffer in the Senate 15 years ago, and uh, says that uh, they they never saw foundation representatives, and you know obviously recognizing the constraint on lobbying, um, they you know the comment is that it would be immensely helpful in generating legislative ideas if, you know, foundations sort of encourage their grantees to bring to the attention of, you know, the Congress and congressional staffers, you know, question, you know, issues, uh, policy issues and policy research. Um, do you do that now? Or do you think that, that that is that too close to the line of the advocacy and lobbying that you're trying to avoid? No, I mean, we absolutely, uh, we support, I mean, most of our grantees, whether it's uh, Institute for Women's Policy Research or, um, or Economic Policy Institute or, or NASI or others, um, you know, we, um, they all do policy analysis, which is regularly brought to the attention of policymakers in Congress and administration and state. Um, we at Ford, we often give general support grants um, or we give core support grants using something called the project grant role. And that enables, you know, 501c3 organizations are allowed under IRS regulations to lobby up to their own lobbying limits. And so, um, you know, the with general support funds, we cannot, we, we at the Ford Foundation do not and cannot um, earmark uh, our funds towards lobbying, but we can certainly give general support um, and then um, and also help build the capacity of our grantees to really clearly understand what the legal limits are that they're working under. Right. So I think, unfortunately, we are getting the hook. We, there are other questions that we could explore, um, but it's time for, to move on to uh, the workshops that um, will conclude today's uh, programming for the um, uh, Academy's uh, annual conference. So I want to thank um, Joel Eskovitz, 
Anawadia and Naomi Stenhouse so much for um, really sharing their view, you know, what they're working on currently and how they view the relationships with their uh, grantee organizations. And so um, thank you very much for, um, first of all, your support for the Academy programs and your support for um, uh, economic security and social insurance policy generally. I think that's, uh, you know, very important to have uh, th that role that you're playing is very important. Uh, and of course, thank you for your time today in helping to uh, add to the conference discussion about these important issues. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Uh, Renee, thank you very much. And thank you to the panelists for a great uh, way to finish the uh, formal part of our program. Before we head to the workshops, just wanted to uh, make a couple of uh, uh, closing comments. Uh, we heard this morning from our two keynote speakers, Jim Roosevelt and Dorian Warren. Uh, Jim highlighted these 